thank you. I'm glad to see everybody this afternoon. Even though I can't see you, I can uh, feel all your good thoughts and your wishes. I hope everybody is um, either sitting in an office with a warm glass of tea and, um, you know, just enjoying this relaxed atmosphere that we get to have. Uh, and we'll just kick it off and get going. Um, one, one note, um, so Chloe said that I'd been in banking for 20 years, but actually the first job I had in banking was working the switchboard, if you can believe that, at um, Commercial Bank and Trust in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And that's the kind of switchboard where you plug in and pull out the uh, phone connectors. And that was in 1979. So it's actually, um, I, I think I was, I think I was a freshman in high school. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'd like to, first of all, before we go into our questions, uh, I'd like to just note that um, I really am thankful to President George and to Chad for the opportunity that I have to serve on the uh, board, on the Oklahoma City Board. I really can't stress enough uh, how wonderful it is to get to be a part of an organization that really um, does emphasize uh, diversity. And I think that that shows up particularly in the 10th district. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to uh, get to learn a lot and also uh, to get to mentor other people. Um, and just, it's a, it's a great opportunity. And I, I just commend, uh, I just commend the Fed's true efforts to really uh, make sure that uh, women owned businesses are represented and that our voices are heard. So, and I, um, I've, I've worked, I've worked closely with both Chad and President, with Mr. Wilkerson and President George for about three and a half years now, and it really is a, a very special opportunity. Um, so really what we're gonna talk about today is uh, including everybody in the premise that diversity makes a better uh, workplace and a better workforce. And the word that we're using is allyship. And uh, I think it's just really important that we recognize that it's not just women helping women that uh, bring this diversity about, but it is. it also involves men uh, just as well. And in fact, maybe that may be a more important piece of it uh, is that this allyship is a lifelong process. This is kind of the definition, a lifelong process of building relationships that are based on trust, consistency and accountability with marginalized individuals and groups of people. Um, research shows that when men are deliberately engaged in gender inclusion programs, 96% of organizations see progress compared to only 30% of organizations where men are not engaged in this process. I mean, that's, a, that's an astounding statistic. And so, um, we'll just start maybe with some introductions and um, we'll have TW introduce himself and then Chad and then Josh and then we'll dive into our questions. Hi everyone, thank you Susan. Um, this is TW Shannon in Oklahoma City. I am the Chief Operating Office, Chief Executive Officer rather of Chickasaw Community Bank here in Oklahoma City. We're a a small community bank of about 260 million in total assets. Uh, we're wholly owned by the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, we have about 120 employees and I've been in my role here uh, coming up on four years and uh, it's been an honor to get to do it. Uh, my training is as an uh, attorney, uh, but don't worry, I'm a recovering one. I haven't practiced. Um, so um, that, that I'm a father of two. Um, I have a 15 year old and an 11 year old um, and I'm excited that tomorrow we will have our last um, for this season, the championship 
for the flag football at Community Christian School in Norman, where my son goes. So uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it and I'm honored to be on this distinguished panel. Thanks, T.W. And then uh, Chad, we'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Ms. Chapman Plum. It's been a long time since anyone called me Mr. Wilkerson, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Well, I figured if I was calling President George by her title, I better uh, extend that courtesy to you. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, but definitely not necessary. Well, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist. I don't know if that's better or worse, but uh, that's my story too, so I'm gonna stick to it like TW. But I'm the, the branch executive and economist at the Oklahoma City branch of the, the Kansas City Fed, and I'm, I'm blessed there to have Susan serve on our board, our local board, and I have definitely learned more from her than I'm sure she's learned from me in the, the several trips we've taken to Tahlequah and the various events that we've been on. So I appreciate that. She's one of four females on our seven member board in Oklahoma City, uh, something I've been proud of and tried to maintain and enhance in the, the 15 years I've been in, in this job. I've been with the Kansas City Fed for 22 years, the first seven, in the research department in Kansas City and then 15 here. Uh, I have uh, have four kids. I have three of those are, are girls. So uh, I'm, I've always been interested in, in female careers and maybe in particular right now my oldest is 17 and starting to look at colleges and uh, think about her career. So that's my, my background. All right, thank you. And so now we'll move on to Josh. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Josh Rowland. I'm the CEO of Lead Bank. Uh, we're a community bank based in Kansas City, Missouri, with uh, three locations. We're about $500 million now. Um, uh, we were chartered in 1928 in Garden City, Missouri, um, and have expanded um, into the metro and now into the downtown core of Kansas City um, over the last 10 years. I've been uh, with the bank since 2008, actually, uh, and uh, my family owns the bank. Um, I'm proud that our bank is uh, majority owned by women um, and that uh, um, my mother uh, is our chairman and majority owner, Sarah Rowland. And, um, and we look at that as an example of, uh, or as a, both an example and a, and a standard to live up to in the way, that we, uh, the way that we do our work here as a community bank. Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of in, uh, Ch Chad and I talk about our daughters all the time. So just by way of who I work with every day, um, I have four adult daughters and three of them work right with me and for me. One is our uh, HR, and risk management and then she does a little bit of everything uh another one is our it director and then uh the most recent uh mom of the group is my executive assistant so um sometimes we we kind of laugh we call it a victory lap but when we need to um when we need to have a family discussion we actually go outside the bank and get in the car and we call it a victory lap, but that's the way that we kind of keep that uh, separate. I don't know, Josh, how that works for you and your family, but um, we try to take that outside the bank whenever it gets a little too opinionated in here and um, we're, we don't want to entertain everybody with our colorful discussion. So anyway, that's just a little bit of of how it works in a small uh, family owned bank and I'm sure you can relate to that. Well, we'll start um, with uh, some comments uh, from TW. So, and I'm sure uh, TW's a fellow, he's a tribal citizen and, um, you know, Cherokee society is matrilineal. So it really was kind of a shock to me that um, women didn't have an equal voice when I was younger because I was just raised in a family where uh, women's voices were valued and in a culture where they were valued. But we all know that that's not the case uh, through our society and, and our world. 
Um, but Chickasaw Community Bank was ranked among the, among the top employers for women in 2018 by Forbes magazine. And TW, tell us a little bit about what uh, Chickasaw Community Bank does to ensure equitable and fair policies for women. And what role do you think you have had in championing uh, these policies? Well, thank you for the wonderful question. And I will tell you, I, I started here at Chickasaw Community Bank in 2017. And so to receive that award in 2018, the only thing I can tell you is that, you know, success is like an Indian rain dance. Timing is everything. Um, but you no, know, in, in all sincerity, um, you, you hit on, I think, what really makes the difference in valuing uh, women and why it's important to do so. Uh, and it really speaks to what I teach to my team is the difference between culture and the difference between values. Uh, values are your beliefs. It is a belief system. And I think many people, many organizations, many businesses uh, have the value of, of equality and, and valuing people um, as, as, a, as, as equal. The, 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 what I saw when I came to Chickasaw Community Bank, then Bank 2, we've since changed to Chickasaw Community Bank, our name, was the need to incorporate it more so into our culture. Culture is behavior, uh, and it, it's a difference. It's one thing to have a value. It's another thing to have a culture. And so what we began the process, I knew that for me, the most important thing was, uh, for I've been in different leadership roles before I came to the bank, the most important piece was to actually for your organization to see you at the at the very top of the organization uh, promoting women and having them in visible vis, visual leadership roles um, and so I, I immediately uh, promoted uh, a young woman uh, who to the role of CFO uh, she's the highest ranking uh, second highest ranking person um, in our bank in our organization uh, outside of myself and she um, has probably the largest um, load of, of, of responsibility of anyone in the bank and she's at the table helping us make decisions about the, the turn of the bank and the reason it's important to to have the idea of valuing women and their unique strengths is because when you look at history and I'm a student of history both my parents were history teachers um, you know you compare you think of a culture and this is not to be disparaging of any cultures just to 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 point out differences you think about Middle Eastern culture at the turn of the last century, um, the Middle East led the world in technology. Um, if, you if you think about that for a moment, the Middle East uh, led the world in technology. And so you ask yourself, what happened? How did, how did that change? Well, the reality is that society was slower to in embrace women uh, as equals into their culture. They, 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 they were slower to embrace the ideas of equality and so I think in many regards, from a technological standpoint, and societal standpoint, they got left behind. And I think that's gonna happen to any organization who doesn't. Women not only make up half of the workforce, uh, but, but they bring a unique perspective uh, to, to, to the, any workforce or to any environment at all. And so how did we do that at Chickasaw Community Bank? More important, that's kind of the why we did it. Uh, but but the, the reason, it, the, the question is, how did we do it? Uh, and the way we did it was, we really tied it to strategic, to our strategic plan. Uh, what I know is about any organization and having led people in different roles is compensation drives behavior. And so um, if you want to see anything in your organization, you tie it to, you tie it to uh, compensation. And so we tied our strategic plan to compensation. We incentivized people, we broke it down into quarterly goals um, and, and we made it clear how each set of goals had to relate to the strategic plan. So. Um, whether you're the teller on the front lines or you're in this executive C-suite, um, you know what your strategic goals are and you know how they directly tie to the strategic plan. And that strategic plan um, specifically uh, spoke to the value of women in treating people uh, as equals in the workplace. And, and lastly, uh, as part of promoting that culture, Every single person that we hire at the bank, I interview and I meet with personally. And my message to them is consistent. And it's this, that when you hire a person, when you hire a woman, you don't just hire a skill set. I didn't just hire a finance degree. I didn't hire an accountant. I didn't hire a loan officer. I hired a person. And that person is either a male or that person is a female. And that each person brings with them their own unique set 
of, of worldview. They have a unique skill set, but we didn't just hire that skill set. They bring with them gifts, talents, worldview, um, idiosyncrasies. We hired a whole person. And so at Chickasaw Community Bank, we strive to value each person as an individual. And part of that individuality is their gender uh, that helps make them. And so we, we do it by valuing the individual and recognizing our differences and celebrating that diversity. That's how we made a difference, I think, in valuing women. And I think that's why we were recognized in 2018. Thank you so much, TW. I really, um, I really like what you said about valuing the individual. That I, I think that really resonates, you know, um, because we, we really all do have our own personality and our idiosyncrasies. And that kind of leads me into my next, uh, my next little topic, which, you know, that, that we address kind of the, the macro aggress aggressions that can occur, which are just in a systemic, um, you know, let's say we're just in a profession that has traditionally been, uh, had quite a, quite a few more men than uh, women, particularly in upper management, which could which could be due to that macro uh, that macro aggressive environment, which it sounds like you all are doing a fantastic job of uh, making sure that you're doing what you can to combat that. And then let's talk a little bit about microaggressions, which are those unintentional uh, verbal or nonverbal behaviors that occur. Uh, really that exclude any group, uh, any gender, race, or ethnic group. And of course, you know, if we're in a, if we're in a profession that's been dominated by men, then, then that's going to exclude uh, potentially women and uh, sometimes people of color, sometimes other ethnic groups. Uh, and, and according to research, 64% of women are exposed to the uh, to the microaggression in the workplace. Can anybody uh, think of an example? Any, any, this is for any of the panelists. Can anybody think of an example uh, of the microaggression and how you recognize that in your, uh, in your work environment and how you uh, work to combat it? Well, um, if I can, I, I, I think I could speak to that. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a way of it's a way of following up from what TW was talking about in terms of culture as behavior. Um, so I would just preface this remark with with saying this that I'm very um, glad to be on this panel because I'm very glad to be part of the dialogue and the discussion around equity and inclusion and justice. Um, I always want to be available to do that. But I have so much to learn, and I have so much to improve upon. I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want any of the people um, in this in this audience or people who are working on this issue uh, to feel like I have it figured out. I'm I'm here because I I want to be active in 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 justice. So, with that said, you see it all the time. You see things all the time, and and it's a it it comes particularly out of a sense of um, um, the fact that um, there is there is a real um, at the risk of making a generalization, um, I think that there are there are just incredibly hardworking women who are coming into these organizations um, that have been built on certain practices that are that in many ways are kind of uh, old and established but not necessarily very good. And women, to, to, the, to TW's point, are bringing in perspectives, the, their whole person. And I think uh, d there's plenty of research that shows that they're actually better financial risk managers than men. And, and there's plenty of Wall Street evidence that shows that. And so, so if you put that situation together, you can kind of imagine that there's a little combustion that's going to happen around how do, we, how do we shake up practices that need to be shaken up? How do we get that new perspective, that diversity that we're looking for, and that acumen, that kind of perspective that women bring? It, there's combustion that happens. You have to be observant of it. And I, there was an incident in our, in our bank uh, a few years ago, a very um, talented and hardworking, you know, incredibly hardworking um, woman here 
um, was in a meeting and uh, there was a debate going on about a process or, or something that we needed to do and she had done her work. She had done her work. And the guys at the table were like, you mean you already did that? Because <laughs> we haven't done it yet. And she's like way ahead of them. And they say, wow, here's an overachiever. That comment undermined her. And it, it made her feel self-conscious about what she's done. And she came to me and she said, I, that didn't feel good. That wasn't right. Because I'm, you want me to do this work. You want me to be ahead. And I said, exactly. You set the standard. It's just that they were, they were unnerved by you setting the standard. So um, I was not, you know, the point is, you, I don't intervene there. But I have to, as an ally and an advocate, find a way for this incredibly strong woman to find a vocabulary and feel supported to be able to, to, be able to uh, uh, challenge that as it happens. And so we, we talked about it. I did a little bit of coaching about like, okay, don't, you know, like, is it, is it something to go uh, completely, uh, to get completely angry about? How can you, temp how can you sh show your anger and frustration in a way that kind of could, you know, that kind of reminds them of what's, what's going on here, but doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't blow it out of proportion because she didn't want that. She didn't want that to be blown out of proportion, but she, but she needed to, she needed to help some help in thinking through from an ally, how she could confront it. And, and, and that I think is the best thing I can do. Cause I can't, I'm not going to, you know, you don't, you don't, you, when your kid's getting bullied on the, on the playground at school, you don't go there and talk to the bully. You try to figure out a way for your child uh, to stand up for herself or himself in a way that still is safe. And that's what I think allies and, and true advocates do is we've got to create safety so that the conversation can happen and so that they have a set of tools to confront the microaggressions because they're happening all the time, especially as TW, you know, if, she, if TW brings in this incredibly talented person to his bank or if there's an incredibly talented person um, in the Kansas City Fed. And, and there is bound to be friction because that's actually, that conflict is what creates greater progress. So we've got to, as allies, we've got to figure out how to manage that without, without, without turning it into something else by creating a supportive environment of allyship um, that allows them to feel strong when they, when, like, like we would anybody so that they can so that they can make progress for themselves you know i think those are really good comments um does anybody have anything they'd like to add to that and then i'll i'll add a couple of comments of my own i i really like I, the go right ahead yeah i i might add i may give you just an anecdotal of where uh, I caught myself and I, I don't know whether to describe it as mi micro or macro, but uh, COVID when, when we, when we first, like, like every business we were grappling with uh, what this means, what's the new normal. Uh, but then you had the practical decisions about, you know, keeping your lobby open and which employees work from home and which ones will continue to work from the bank. And so we were, we were a small group of us were looking at, okay, which job functions can work from home? Our, our goal was let's send as many people home to work from home as we can. Who? So it started with real practical the first week. Who has a laptop? Who actually can physically do it? Um, and then it became more along. All right, we 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 have everybody with laptops. Who makes sense? And we were when we were looking at the list, we were doing it in terms of giving a preference to mothers. And I think it was, um, I think it was. Um, I, I don't know that it was done consciously. Uh, maybe it was for some, but I think it was more subconscious. And I remember backing up and saying, let's rethink this. Um, let's not think of it in terms of mothers. And because I know, you know, what I, what I always say to all of our employees is, listen, the work, the work family balance is very important here at Chickasaw Community Bank. It is a value of ours. But that, ba that balance is different for every person. Every single person finds that balance differently and we need to support them and however that balance is. And so we, we, we backed up and I said, I think we're giving a preference to people who we believe are, who, who have children. 
Um, and that may not be the best route to do that because we may miss someone. Um, and, it, and, it, and it may not be the best. We're assuming that them working from home is a benefit to them. Let's not do that. So let's survey employees and better understand. I think that was a, a subconscious um, maybe aggression that could have happened at the bank that we were we were in the act of doing in the name of doing what was right and fair. Um, I think we were making some assumptions that we didn't, and it all worked out. That as as many of you probably found out, uh, we sent we sent a lot of people home kicking and screaming who didn't want to go. But now I think I'm gonna have a hard time ever getting them back. I think it takes about <laughs> three months uh, for people to adjust, and they decide they really like it. So I don't know if that was helpful, but that was kind of an anecdotal example of how I think we called ourselves on the rug and called ourselves out on it. Yeah, and I think just being able to examine, uh, like why why you automatic, why you make assumptions and just being open to examining uh, why you're making assumptions, I think I'm sure it um, has strengthened your organization just because you're willing to be open to that examination. Uh, one of the things, you know, I mean, microaggression happens all the time and um, I'm, I'm probably, I'm particularly sensitive to it. Um, and I mean, I just, I try to have a radar for it. Uh, and, you know, I actually have intervened whenever I feel like the person who's maybe doing the, uh, un if it's particularly, if it's unintentional aggression, I will frequently um, get, get an aside and in no way, you know, it's not disciplinary. It's not anything other than, um, you know, hey, you prop, you may not even know that you're that you're coming off this way, but here's mm -hmm. how it might have been perceived. And I I don't tell uh, I don't tell the other employee that I'm doing that. So there's no, and in fact, I'll tell the um, our, I'll tell whoever I'm chatting with. I didn't mention this to them. I'm just observing this you know, I'm just going to uh, let you know. And, and one of the other the things that I do with when Josh mentioned um, coaching, I frequently will tell employees, uh, both male and female, not to offer apologies uh, routinely inside a business setting where there's no uh, need to offer an apology. And I find women do this very frequently. And um, I think it has something to do with how we're uh, acculturated. And, and I also um, challenge everybody in our organization not to let interruptions go um, because some of that microaggression that we're talking about could be where people try to talk over one another. Um, and guys, I hate to tell you, but men do that more frequently than women in a meeting environment. And I personally, if I'm chairing a meeting, I don't let the interruption, whether it's a male or a female, I usually don't let the interruption stand. Um, but I do think it's a very uh, tricky situation to try to intervene, uh, particularly when you don't want to cause friction that shouldn't be there. So that's just a little bit of an aside. Um, so Chad, um, how this question's kind of for you and then everybody can jump in. Um, you know, achieving equality for women does not necessarily mean that everything will be the same uh, for men and women. And are there differences in the opportunities that you provide or that the Fed tries to provide? And if you could just give us a couple of comments on that, that'd be great. Sure, thanks, Susan. I'll try to take a stab at that. But the, the culture at the Kansas City Fed from when I started in the late 90s was well ahead, I'd say, of its time in recognizing the benefits of having diverse perspectives um, at, at, at high levels and working over time to achieve that um, across people that can move into the positions but also I'd say in places where we could speed that process up and benefit from it sooner, I think we also um, took advantage of that. Uh, our president prior to Esther, Tom Honig, 
I know this was a, a high priority for him early on. Uh, and so it's just, it's always been part of the culture for me in 22 years. And I assume that's not the case in most organizations that have been doing this for 22 years. So some examples for us are on our, our boards of directors or for speakers at our conferences. Uh, in part because we're such a public organization, we serve the entire public. Um, I think maybe Susan, you mentioned earlier that the, the top executives at many organizations, especially 10, 20 years ago, were, were white men. Uh, that's still the case in some industries, including some key ones in, in Oklahoma. Um, there's progress being made, I think, in each of those, but that takes time. But there are ways in which um, we can have females take part to be representative of the population in our, our boards, our advisory councils, our conferences, even if they don't have the highest title. It's very clear that they are a very uh, talented expert in that field. Uh, and it, it's more meaningful, I think, to our audience. That's always a diverse audience to our employees to have that um, example there. So that's just always been a, a focus of our bank. It's kind of been instilled in me. It's been a high priority of mine, uh, being responsible for our board of directors, for the energy conference that the Kansas City Fed puts on to seek to do that uh, as we continue to push towards there being as, men, as diverse of a senior management across organizations um, as there can be. And we're just not quite there yet. Well, I sure understand um, that we're that we're not there yet, but really just the fact that um, we have a, a panelist uh, that we have a panel with uh, all men on the panel that are willing to um, acknowledge and discuss these issues, I think is uh, indicative of progress. Um, so Josh or TW, do you have anything to add? Are there any things that your institutions do uh, particularly for women, or um, or uh, or do you just really feel like the uh, is there training? Uh, are there any other things that you guys would like to add? Um, I think that the, I think that the point about you know that things are that things are not necessarily the same, even as you go for equity, is a really key point. I think you have to just be sensitive to, uh, and be listening and attentive, not just sensitive, sensitive is overused, attentive to like the different realities that people face. And so you have to create different structures um, for, to, support, to support women, knowing, knowing and acknowledging that they are probably doing the lion's share of the, of the childcare in their family, even as, an, even as a senior executive, even as a rising executive. That burden is disproportionately all across America falling on women. So it's not unfair to be attentive to that fact. It's not unjust to men to be attentive to the fact that the women have different sets of responsibilities. So I think, I think that goes along with Chad's point. You know, I think that that really, really shows up when you have a whole segment of the population that's going to school virtually. I know for our families, it just, you know, the, really the house could be falling down around my, my son-in-laws and, and they're just, you know, they're just not paying attention to everything that it takes to keep a child in a virtual classroom. And um, so I talk to my daughters about that every day. And uh, that's not to say that it's not good sometimes for the dad to, to uh, be the one doing that because, you know, it's just, it's just different. That's what it is. And that's uh, made for some good entertainment in our family. Um, something else I might add on this, and it's kind of related, I think, to several of the questions so far is the importance, I think, of having a you know, a network of female trusted associates um, that, that I can, you know, throw ideas off of to see how they stick. I know how they stick in my mind, whatever that means as an economist, as an executive, but as a man. Um, but I have, you know, a couple of people who have worked with, the two who have worked most closely with me for the last 15 years are both on here, this call today. And I'm constantly in conversation with them about 
how the things that the banker is doing or that I'm doing comes across to them and all that they are. Um, some of which are similar to me, but one that's different is as, as a female. And I'd say also my bosses, my immediate boss, Esther, the chair of our branch board are also females. So I have a lot of opportunities for me to learn how microaggressions or policies that we're putting in place with good intentions, but might come across wrong, uh, how that is um, felt and uh, received by females. Well, you know, I think just uh, the fact that you're willing to open yourself up to say, hey, what, what does this sound like? What does this feel like? Is this uh, a legitimate approach? I think that's really, really important. Um, and I, I really don't think that that collaborative approach can be overstated. Uh, and I think that that really shows up I think that'll show up on the bottom line of a for, for-profit institution. And it'll show up in that, like that strategic plan that TW was talking about. And it'll show up in the strategic plan um, at the Fed level. Well, I think it already, I think it already does. Um, so uh, Josh, Lead Bank became one of the few community banks in the United States with women comprising a majority of the independent directorship of your bank. Uh, and women make up half of all the directors of your bank. So, and you're known for your community focus and female entrepreneurship uh, growth. So can you just uh, speak to that a little bit and Kind of tell us a little of how your bank got there and how you're going to stay there or make make progress. You know, it's funny. It's it, this is a little bit of this is this this whole subject is one that just always gets me kind of um, animated. So, um, you know, we we ended up with uh, pursuing or 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 getting a majority of our of our, of our uh, independent directors to be women by asking women to be on our board. We just defaulted to asking women to be on our board. We didn't default to assuming that men should be on the board of the bank. And, and I, I really don't want to, oh, I don't want to understate that. We found um, a talented um, longtime retailer in the Plaza Shopping District of Kansas City, Ursula Tarazi, to join our board. She was a banker before. Nobody had ever asked her. She became a client. She helps us understand small business in Kansas City. We asked um, uh, a retired Walmart executive from Kansas City, Susan Chambers, to join our board. We asked um, a, uh, the head of the heavy constructors, Bridget Williams, the head of the EDC, she's the head of, she also runs the Kansas City EDC, or she was the uh, former chair of the Kansas City EDC. She is the first African-American uh, uh, regional president, Kansas City president um, of the AFL-CIO. These are incredibly qualified people. And they are, they're everywhere. And the notion, the notion that that it's unusual or surprising, or people ask me, how did you do that? We just opened our eyes to actually who was doing business, who was doing good work, who was in positions of influence in Kansas City. And I called them and I said, do you wanna have lunch? Do you wanna talk about, tell me, tell me about, tell me more. Do you wanna join a board of a bank and help us be better at serving this community? And the fact is, it's, it's barely any more complex than the way people got white, white men on bank boards. That was just done on the golf course or as your fraternity brother. There's nothing, and to, to, to the idea that, that there's some higher requirement of competence or, or there's some, we've got to ask a different set of questions of women business leaders or of women social leaders or women civic leaders than we would have asked of men. I frankly think it's, it, it is the macroaggression of the discrimination that we face in this, in this, that we're trying to tackle here, because there is nothing to it. Every one of us, everyone on this panel, 
knows great women business owners. They know great uh, uh, women um, civic leaders. They're all over the place. And to say that somehow we can't, we still can't see them. I think it's, I think it's incredibly false. And I think it's, uh, I think it's so easy to fix. It is so easy to fix. Um, and I, 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 it gets me, as I said, uh, as my caveat before this, it gets me very animated um, because I just don't think we can tolerate anymore the idea that there just aren't any qualified women capable of serving in, in these positions of leadership and oversight in our banks or in our companies. It's just, it's just a lie. I think it's just a lie. Well, you know, um, that kind of, so Chloe, are we set, are we, are we going into Q and A now or are we going to stick with our panel? Hi, Susan. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we have about time for maybe one question from the audience before uh, going into our, our closing question for the day. Um, so if you want, Susan, I can go ahead and read that question from the audience. I think I can, I think I can pull it up here. So um, Sherry Higginbotham has a question for us. I'm curious how the bankers on the staff have handled on the bankers on the panel have handled staff requests to be able to work from home during the pandemic, particularly those with kids or helping aging parents. Boy, I know about the aging parent thing that may be at a higher risk. Have you implemented a standard policy or do you handle these case by case? And how widespread is the need? That's about four really good questions in there, so. I'm happy to take that one. Um, we at Chickasaw Community Bank, we, we got in our in our room and we were very early on. We, we said a couple of things. We said, number one, we need to know what the CDC, what the professionals are saying. And number two, we want to go beyond what they're whatever they're recommending. We want to go beyond in the name of safety. That was kind of our, our mantra. And uh, as it relates directly to employee requests, first, it was practical. Um, who could who could work from home, who had the ability. And, uh, and then we made a commitment, we're going to give the ability to, for anyone to work from home who feels like they need to. So we, we, we resisted a, a policy because anytime you've got bright yellow lines, you've always got somebody who's just over the line, who's receiving the maximum benefit, and you've got somebody who's just under who didn't. Um, and, 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 we, and, and frankly, uh, we, we even came back and said that we had, some, we had to um, reevaluate some of the decisions we had made. Some people we found out were not very productive working from home, but the far majority are. In fact, most of our producers are 34% more productive working from home. And so it's actually made us rethink our entire model about uh, square footage of building, uh, how many, you know, what long term. But we are also wrestling with the idea about culture. Um, how do you maintain uh, your culture? Because that's an important part to me when, every, when you're not seeing and touching everybody every single day so we didn't have a direct policy on it uh what we did we asked the question who would like to who's able to do it and then what resources do you need to be able to do that and it's and it's worked well uh for us very well and the other thing i will say that we did on COVID that i think was has been that we get a lot of positive feedback is we do a weekly and i give my hr director a female uh executive uh, all the credit for it was just communication. Uh, we were real big about, we're gonna communicate where the bank is. When we have someone who becomes ill or is diagnosed, we're gonna communicate that. We communicate weekly on what the uh, um, uh, CDC is recommending. Uh, we, we, early on, we were, rec we were communicating about what the governor and mayors of our cities were communicating to and all of the cities that were involved in. So communication and no, no set policy, uh, but we had an internal commitment to accommodate whoever needed to be accommodated. Yeah, and you know, I can speak to that just a little bit. It's really hard to have a set of standardized policies when the guidance changes so frequently. Mm -hmm. And it's just, um, it really is a challenge. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it really just requires a lot of attention on the part of upper management to make sure that you're doing things in a way that's fair and um, helps everybody. 
I think I think that may be all the time we have for questions. So in closing, um, I would just take comments from you gentlemen with regard to uh, whether you have an individual partnership or mentoring commitment to women in your bank or to a program that supports that. And um, what does your organization do, if anything in particular, to support uh, women's progress into management and leadership positions? I can uh, begin on that, I guess, Susan. So our, uh, a couple of specific areas where our bank focuses on this are in a couple of uh, professions that are uh, very un underrepresented by women, and that would be economists and IT staff. So we have a, uh, a you know mentoring program for the more senior female economists with any new um, incoming PhD economists, the new research associates who have a desire to become an economist uh, is a regular get together there. And then for on the IT side, we have a you know girls in tech, a number of programs there that are specifically targeted towards um, secondary education level females interested in joining the tech realm to try to diversify our, um, our workforce down the road on that front. All right, Josh or TW, do you have anything to add to that question? The question was specifically regarding, are, are there any particular programs in your bank. Um, I love Josh's answer, which is basically, I think Josh has already answered it, which is basically, um, you just include them, <laughs> you know, like it, it's really like, you know, it's not rocket science now because there are many qualified women. Um, right. So, That's right. Uh, yeah. Um, my encouragement to all of you that are um, listening today is, uh, really take every opportunity that you can to be of service. If you're asked to participate on a board, anything that gives you extra knowledge uh, regarding your profession or even something that you don't know a lot about. I started my service on the Kansas City Board through the Community Development Advisory Board and um, and, you know, I think service is one way to quickly gain knowledge. So I would just encourage, I would just encourage everybody that's listening to uh, develop an attitude of service and you'll really, you'll find yourself learning uh, really a lot more than you could have ever uh, dreamt. Anyway, uh, I don't know where we are on our time. I want to be conscious of that, but well, I'll jump in and I just want to say thank you so much uh, to each of you for such great comments on what your personal philosophies are for supporting women, um, your organization's policies for supporting women, and some of your personal examples. Um, we really appreciate your thoughts on allyship and the great conversation that you have this afternoon. Um, so for all of our participants, if you want to give our esteemed panelists a round of applause in the chat and uh, say thank you for your time today, again, we really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and perspectives.